Good morning. Since Thanksgiving is over, uh, I am assuming that we are now in the Christmas season, and because of that, I have chosen, as our scripture reading this morning, uh, the scripture from 3 Nephi, chapter 1, which could be called the Book of Mormon Christmas story. And I know that through the Thanksgiving season that we've all um, eaten well, we've eaten moderately, and we've maintained or even lost some weight, and we will continue to do that throughout the Christmas holidays. Uh, I will not ask for a show of hands, uh, beginning with me. Uh, but from Third Nephi chapter 1, I'd like to read this. And I'm skipping some verses for time from uh, verses 4 through 23. And I've also uh, eliminated 10 uh, phrases, now it came to pass. So that, that will shorten our, shorten our reading just a little bit. In the commencement of the 90 and second year, behold, the prophecies of the prophets began to be fulfilled more fully. For there began to be greater signs and greater miracles wrought among the people. But there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled, which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. But behold, the believers did watch steadfastly for that day and that night and that day, which should be as one day as if there were no night, that they might know that their faith had not been in vain. Now there was a day set apart by the unbelievers, that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the prophet. When Nephi, the son of Nephi, saw this wickedness of his people, his heart was exceeding sorrowful. He went out and bowed himself down upon the earth and cried mightily to his God in behalf of his people. Yea, those who were about to be destroyed because of their faith and the tradition of their fathers. He cried mightily unto the Lord all that day. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Lift up your head and be of good cheer, for behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given. And on the morrow come I into the world, to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. And behold, the time is at hand, and this night shall the sign be given. And the words which came unto Nephi were fulfilled according as they had been spoken. For behold, at the going down of the sun there was no darkness, and the people began to be astonished, because there was no darkness when the night came. And there were many who had not believed the words of the prophets, who fell to the earth and became as if they were dead, for they knew that the great plan of destruction which they had laid for those who believed in the words of the prophets had been frustrated. For the sign which had been given was already at hand, and they began to know that the Son of God must shortly appear. And there was no darkness in all that night, but it was as light as though it was midday. And the sun did rise in the morning again, according to its proper order, and they knew that it was the day that the Lord should be born, because of the sign which had been given. Yea, all things, every wit, according to the words of the prophets. It's a beautiful song and a very nice rendition of it by Rachel and Bob. Thank you so much. Uh, good ministry. Well, since we're in the uh, Christmas season, I, I did some research and, and found a couple of uh, uh, surveys that I would like to share with you. 
One is rather lighthearted. The other is uh, uh, on, on a more somber note. But um, uh, th this first survey that I found asked several questions, and they include, what is your favorite Christmas movie? What is your favorite Christmas song? And what is your favorite Christmas television special? And I, I'm sure this was a very scientific survey. Uh, two weeks ago, I uh, substituted for, the, uh, for David and, and Jeff in the senior high class, and I shared with them the idea of the survey, and, and, and I received their response. Uh, we sort of came up with a corporate response to each of these. I did not share with them the answers from the survey. And so, uh, but I will today, I will share the survey and also what the senior high class said. Uh, favorite Christmas movie, uh, third place went to uh, Christmas Vacation. Second place, which was also the choice of the senior high class, uh, Elf. And first place, uh, favorite Christmas movie, uh, this is sort of a generational thing, uh, some of us with more mileage on our odometers uh, probably remember this a little better, but I was surprised at some of the younger people knowing this too. Uh, it was put out in 1946, and uh, it starred Jimmy Stewart, and the name of it was It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, okay. Uh, favorite Christmas song? Um Third place in the survey went to O Holy Night. Second place was White Christmas. Bing Crosby, maybe? Originally? Yeah, maybe. And number one, Silent Night. Now, the senior high class didn't choose any of those. They, they went a different direction. I think it was Noah that uh, uh, suggested O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, and then I think, I don't remember who, maybe Ethan suggested Grandma got run over by a reindeer. <laughs> and, and after a lot of debate, uh, it was really close, but uh, they chose O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And then our favorite Christmas uh, television special. Third place, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Second place, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And first place, according to the survey, first place, according to the senior high class, and first place in my heart, Charlie Brown Christmas. How, how wonderful it is, how refreshing it is for me to watch Charlie Brown Christmas. <coughs> to, with, with all the stuff that's on television, to, to hear Charlie Brown in frustration, say, can anybody tell me what Christmas is all about? And Linus comes to Charlie Brown and he says, yes, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And then Linus begins to quote from Luke chapter 2 about the angels and the shepherds in the field and the babe in a manger. Uh, so nice. If you get a chance, I recommend Charlie Brown Christmas. On a, on a more somber note, I, I found another survey that was uh, put out just a, a year ago, um, and, and it said that 90% of all Americans will celebrate in some way the Christmas season. That sounds pretty good. But then it went on to say that 50, uh, 56% of all those people will not have the birth of Christ as a part of their Christmas celebration. And then it said, uh, another survey question was about going to church at some point during the Christmas season. And 30% of the people in this survey will participate in a church service during the Christmas season. 70% will not. So you guys are ahead of a lot of people already since we've already unofficially designated this as the Christmas season. There was one answer in a, in a list of answers. 53% uh, chose uh, the answer, nah, going to church really isn't my thing. And I, I fear that those numbers keep getting worse each year as far as people placing Christ in the center, not 
you know, we're, we're just talking about the Christmas celebration. He ought to be in the center of our lives at all times. And I fear that we are traveling down the same path as the old uh, tribes of Israel uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, a once righteous people who turned away from God and continued to complain even after the, the parting of the Red Sea and the manna that was given to them. And yet they complained and they built their own idols just as, as we build our own idols sometimes today. And because of their iniquity, these people were dispersed and many of them have lost their identity. Though the good news is in the last days we're told that that the tribes of Israel will again know who they are. As a nation, we're much like the Jaredites and the Nephites of the, of the Book of Mormon. Again, righteous civilizations who turn away from God and because of the great light that they once had, and they turned away so far from God that both of these civil, civilizations were, were basically destroyed. So many people say today, I want to be loosened from the, the chains of religion. Um, was it Karl Marx? He spoke against religion and said religion is the opiate of the people. And so he was wanting people to break the chains of religion. And by breaking the chains of religion, they entered into the chains of communism. You see, in, in the world, and especially in, in the spiritual realm, there, there are only two possibilities. We have righteousness and we have evil. And if we make all these efforts to break the chains of righteousness and we move away from it, we simply move into the realm of evil. There is no choice of neutrality. We're either in one realm or the other and we're moving toward one goal or the other. Nothing in between. And so many people don't realize that. To say that we're free of religion doesn't really mean that we're free because we're in something much worse in that darker realm. I'd like to share a couple of scriptures from uh, the Book of Mormon. And I thought it was kind of neat as I sat here last Sunday and heard uh, Brother Jeff Van Bibber uh, read one of these two scriptures in his introduction last week in the uh, 11 o'clock service. And, and the reason I want to read these two scriptures is because, first of all, uh, they're talking to us. They're talking about the Gentiles and to the Gentiles of the last days. But secondly, I find it very interesting that they talk about our need to get out of iniquity. These people saw our day. Those prophets, they saw us. They saw our nation. And they're not saying, be careful and don't go into iniquity. They saw that we were in iniquity and they're saying, you need to get out of it. And so please keep those things in mind when you, read, when you listen to this as I read them. Uh, the first one is from Ether chapter 1, verse 34. Um, and this cometh unto you, O ye Gentiles, that ye may know the decrees of God, that ye may repent and not continue in your iniquities until the fullness come, that ye may not bring down the fullness of the wrath of God upon you as the inhabitants of the land have hitherto done. And the other scripture reading I'd like to share is from uh, Third Nephi chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Hearken, O ye Gentiles, and hear the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, which he hath commanded me that I should speak concerning you. For behold, he commandeth me that I should write, saying, Turn all ye Gentiles from your wicked ways, and repent of your evil doings, of your lyings and deceivings, and of your whoredoms, and of your secret abominations, and your idolatries, and of your murders, and your priestcrafts, and your envyings, and your strifes, and from all your wickedness and abominations. Wow, quite a laundry list. Brother Albert A. Smith 
presented a radio broadcast in November of 1937. And in a part of that uh, message that he gave over the radio, he quoted from President Abraham Lincoln. Brother Albert A. said this, What are the enemies that threaten our spiritual inheritance as a nation? Who menaces our freedom? In his Springfield Address in 1837, Abraham Lincoln said, At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? Shall we expect some transatlantic giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never in a thousand years. If destruction is our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Then Brother Albert A. said that Lincoln seemed to speak under a prophetic spirit. Our dangers are not so much from abroad as from within. And then Brother Albert A. referenced General John J. Pershing. He was the leader of the American forces during World War I. It's sort of interesting in what I'm about to read that uh, Brother Albert A. calls it the World War because in 1937 there had only been one World War. Brother Albert A. said, The growth of organized crime in America so alarmed General Pershing that he issued a call to America. His article, published in the American magazine, was headed, We Are at War. This man, who had commanded our expeditionary forces abroad during the World War and had seen its horrors and dangers, declared that we now face more dangerous enemies at home than we did then abroad in all the armies of the enemy. And it's, it's, it's amazing to me the, the concern that the people back in this day had for wickedness in our country, and yet look how much farther we've moved in that direction since then. Brother Albert A. finished by saying, I represent a people who believe that long centuries ago, America was chosen of the Lord to be a choice land of liberty. We believe that he directed the discovery of this land and the founding of the nation. To us, the Constitution is an inspired document. We believe that if the nation is ever destroyed or subjugated, it will be because the people have fallen into iniquity and lost the favor of heaven. And my my concern is this, and I've, I've spoken about this before. And I, I, I don't continue to do this apologetically. That's something that's really on my heart. But, but as, a, as a country, we don't seem to be willing, and again, as a country, because I know that we feel differently, but as a country, we're not willing to turn to God. We continue to, to move toward our own destruction in an effort to what many people feel to free ourselves from all these issues. And so we just don't seem to want to turn to God. In his book, Three Visitations of Christ and His Coming in Glory, Brother Adolf Lundin, uh, and this book, was, this book was published in 1966, and I'm, I'm going to quote a couple of things that he said. Um, and, and one quote I think applies to us as much today. I think it's human nature. as as it did in the 1960s. And then he talks a lot about the church leadership and some of the issues back then, and we all know what happened there. And then the final sentence, I'm not so sure that that final sentence is more appropriate today than it was even back then. Brother Lundeen said, Today, many of our people are content to remain as we are as long as we prosper materially. And I think that certainly applies to us today. Sometimes we get the mistaken feeling that if we're doing okay physically, we must be doing okay spiritually. There's no great need to become more spiritual than what we are. And then uh, Brother Lundin went on to say, 
This spirit has also entered among men in church leadership. Some are dangerously making fables out of God's word. In so doing, they will lose the spirit of God. World conditions warn us of the need for Zion, but unless we do something soon, and this is the one that I think really applies to us more today than it did in 1966. World conditions warn us of the need for Zion, but unless we do something soon, we can only have Zion by our suffering. If this nation is not going to turn to God, then it's even more incumbent upon those who are the faithful to be willing to give their all to the work of the Lord. And and, and not just those of us at Colburn Road, not just those of us in the Restoration, not only those of us under the Book of Mormon umbrella, but all Christian faithful people of all denominations. It is incumbent upon us to be that salt of the earth. We must be that light on a hill. We must be that beacon for others who seek. Or I fear that our nation will be in serious trouble. In order to do what we have to do, we have to be willing to give our all. And I know that at all of us, and, and me include, I'm willing to do a lot. But are we willing to give our all? And there's a, there's a big jump there from a lot to all. I found it interesting. Uh, I... I shared a scripture that Brother Jeff had read last Sunday, and uh, today I was going to mention a a book that I haven't heard people mention in a long time, the Lectures on Faith, and Jason shared that in the Sunday school class today, uh, Lectures on Faith. Um, And and I encourage you, if you've not read that, especially church members, you should have a copy of the Lectures on Faith. It's a small booklet, and um, it doesn't take a long time to read. I, I don't necessarily suggest to just pick it up and read it. I, you're probably smarter than me. I, I have to take a little bit at a time and sort of digest it. And I don't even try to read a book like that, you know, from cover to cover. I just take a couple of pages and set it down, think about it, and read it a little bit the next day. But if you, if you have, you should have a copy in your home. Take it out and, and read the lectures on faith. But in section 6-6, entitled Necessity of Sacrifice, It says, let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. Our religion must require us to give our all. There's a a story in, in the book of Mark and uh, Mark chapter 10 it's also in Matthew I think chapter 17 or 19 uh, it's about this fella and it, isn't it funny when when you read stories in the scriptures that we we all probably if we all talked about it we'd all have a little bit different point of view about what the story is about uh, and and we all probably would understand the the meaning but you know how did it come about and I really uh, appreciated the opportunity to go to the, the Chosen the other night and, and watch uh, someone's idea of how things played out. But, you know, just to see that these, these were people. These were just guys, and they had issues with one another. It kind of makes me feel better, you know, because I, I guess I lift those guys and many of you kind of on a pedestal and You know, I'm just struggling to try to to get up there with all my problems and issues. So this fellow, so I have this idea of how this this scripture played out in Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning of verse 17. So this young guy, he, he comes to Christ and he asks Christ, he says, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
Now, the way I see this, and, and, and Christ, of course, the first part of his answer was, and which would be an excellent topic for a, a sermon one day. Christ says, you know, why do you call me good? Only, only God is good. And I don't think Jesus was saying he's not good. I think he was saying, I am God. I am God in the flesh, and I am good. But why are you saying that? Do you realize that? I, okay, so anyway. Uh, so then Jesus continued, and he said, so I, I think this guy is kind of looking for a pat on the back, a, a, a kind of an attaboy. And, 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 and so he asked this question, and, and he kind of knows what Jesus is going to answer. And this is just the way I see it. Yeah, maybe I'm totally wrong. So, so he asked Jesus, you know, what, what do I need to do for eternal life? And G Jesus then went on and said, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And the man hears this, and, and quite pleased, I'm sure, he says, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I knew you were going to say that, and I've done all those things. And now I'm ready for my pat on the back and my attaboy. And so Jesus beheld this fellow, and Jesus loved him. And said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Man, you've done all these wonderful things. You're really doing a good job, but you're missing one thing. And now the guy is probably a little perplexed. Like, you know, what, what else is there? And Jesus said, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And the man was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. This was a good fellow who, who followed the commandments. He was willing to give a lot. But he wasn't quite give, willing to give his all. Now, I would normally begin working my way into my conclusion at this point with a challenge for us to, to concentrate more on our daily lives on, on the spiritual aspects of our daily lives, that we need to, to, to come closer to Christ. We need to have that closer, more intimate walk with Christ. And we need to be prepared that we might be able to fight these daily spiritual battles and to be ready for whatever tribulation might come upon us as a, as a people and as a country in the near future. But I, I prefer today to, to, to do something a little different um, because we're in the Christmas season, I, I want to share some three thoughts that I hope will, will be uplifting. First of all, I want to go back to the scripture reading. In the scripture reading, the, the unbelievers set aside a day to kill the believers. Excuse me. Because they claimed that the day had passed that had been proclaimed by Samuel the Lamanite. And, and, and very joyously, they're, they're very happy, you know, that's not going to happen. And we're so tired of hearing about it, we're going to kill all the believers on this certain day. And so this fellow Nephi goes out and he prays and prays all day. And, and he was given an answer that, that evening, he was told, it's about to happen. It's coming. You're going to see it. And on the morrow, I'm coming into the world. And, and so these people, these believers, they received what they needed exactly when they needed it. The sign was coming and Christ was coming into the world. And so the first thought that I, I want to share with you is that God's going to give us what we need whenever we need it. We, we don't always get what we want. You know, when I was a young guy, uh, gosh, 10 years ago, uh, I, I used to, you know, really used to bother me. I don't want everybody to laugh. Uh, it used to bother me that the RLDS church didn't own the temple lot. 
I had never visited up here. I, I was in Pensacola. But I, I heard these stories that the RLD, we didn't have the temple lot. We're, we're going to build a temple. But we don't even have the temple lot. Some other group does. Some group called the temple lot church. And why would God do that? Why couldn't we have it? And that, again, that, that really it, it bothered me. And, and so over the years, what happens? So, so now here's the RLDS church. And you know, now they want to build this temple. And had they owned that land, where would that temple have been built? But there is no if there because it wasn't going to happen. But, but what I'm saying is what I thought I needed or what I thought the church needed and what we wanted, we didn't have. God didn't give it to us. But now I look back, we can all look back and say, you know, that, that's pretty good that things worked out the way it did. And so if, if we don't think we're getting what we need from God, it's probably because we're not looking at it in the right perspective. So God will always give us what we need and he will give it to us when we need it. Secondly, well, I really enjoy this. I, I want to share with you from 3 Nephi chapter 8. Beginning with verse 5. And it came to pass, and Jesus is in the, in the Book of Mormon lands. He's been crucified and he's come here. And he's, he's, he's ministering to these people. And, and what I want you to listen to is not every little thing that he did for these people. But try to imagine in your mind the relationship, the feeling Jesus had toward the people. And the relationship that the people felt toward Jesus. And it came to pass that when Jesus had thus spoken, he cast his eyes round about again on the multitude and beheld they were in tears and did look steadfastly upon him as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them. And he said unto them, Behold, my bowels are filled with compassion towards you. Have ye any sick among you? Bring them hither. For I have compassion upon you. And it came to pass that when he had thus spoken, all the multitude with one accord did go forth with their sick and their afflicted and their lame and with their blind and with their dumb and with all they that were afflicted in any manner. And he did heal them every one as they were brought forth unto him. And they did all, both they who had been healed and they who were whole bowed down at his feet and did worship him. And as many as could come for the multitude did kiss his feet, insomuch that they did bathe his feet with their tears. What a, what a, what a relationship they had. These people loved Christ and they wanted him to stay. And Christ had compassion upon them and he healed them. And, and the reason I share this is because this is what Zion is going to be about. This is what we have to look forward to. So that's my, that's my second thought that I want to leave with you. First, that God is, is totally faithful to us. And secondly, that this is the relationship that we can have with Christ. And whatever we endure between now and the coming of Zion will be well worth the rewards that will be for us. And thirdly, I want to share this thought. From Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 22, verse 23b, it says, and this is God speaking, He says, There is no end to my works, neither to my words. For this is my work and my glory. Now, what, is it, what does that mean? This is His passion. This is His desire, His number one desire. The greatest desire. Power in all the universe. And you know, that is such an understatement to be. That doesn't begin to explain the power of God just to say that he's the greatest power in all the universe. I, I, it's, I, I'm frustrated that I, I can't say something that would be more adequate. But I have to leave it at that. The greatest power in all the universe. His work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. 
The greatest desire of the greatest power in all the universe is for you and for me to dwell with him in eternal glory. The greatest of all gifts. That's what he wants. And if that's not a comfort, and if that doesn't give us strength as we consider that, then I I don't think we quite grasp what, what that means. But it's something we really need to contemplate. So, as we, during this, this season, this special season, we, we, we worship Christ and we, we will worship his birth and we worship Christ in a manger. But, but our pastor at a priesthood meeting uh, counseled us not, not, not to leave him in the, in the, in the manger. So let's, let's consider him in the manger, but let's not leave him there. Let's, let's not leave him on the hillside preaching and teaching and feeding and healing. And let's not leave him on the cross where he died such an agonizing and cruel death just for you and me. But let's remember him and worship him also as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings who returns shortly to receive his own, to redeem his people. And that can be us if we simply Come to that point where we can give our all and that we endure. I want to close with a quote from Jonathan Kahn. Jonathan Kahn recently published his latest book and it's out. It's called Return of the Gods. And at the end of the book, he has an epilogue. And I'd like to share with you how he ended his epilogue. He said, the darkness will end, but the light will be forever. And so, as it is written, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. For greater, much greater, is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Merry Christmas.